Well, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And by the way, you can disregard the content on the sermon notes page on the back of your bulletin because that sermon is not happening today. Since I didn't know I was preaching today until about 12.30 this morning, uh, and I wasn't going to work on Psalm 119 when Ron had already done some work on it. So we'll be in another passage, 2 Timothy 2. What I think is a, a pithy and powerful passage that will help prepare us uh, for partaking in the Lord's Supper later on in our service. The Lord's Supper meal, as you know, is, it's a meal of remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And remembrance, remembering has a great heritage in the Bible. There's a huge emphasis on remembering throughout the Bible. So God's people of old were to remember the Passover every year, to remember what God did to Pharaoh, to remember how God led them through the desert those 40 years, to remember the crossing of the Jordan and to even commemorate the crossing of the Jordan with 12 stones for generations to come to see and to know that the Lord was faithful. That word remember, man, it just shows up in front of almost everything. Remember the Lord, remember his covenant, remember his promises, remember to obey, remember and do not forget. Remember how bad it went for God's people when they so quickly forgot about him. And as I said, we have a sacred meal in the new covenant we call it communion or the Lord's Supper, whereby we remember the Lord's death until he comes. We'll get to that, but first we need to look at a passage that begins with a call to remember Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2, verses 8 to 13. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we've died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Well, this is a passage about the gospel. The gospel. The good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins as a gift received by grace through faith, not of works. Paul wrote this letter to Timothy in part. You can look back at chapter 1 and just notice at verse 8. He wrote it to Timothy so Timothy wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. In fact, he would be willing to suffer for the gospel. That was Paul's hope. And Paul encourages Timothy in our passage in three different aspects of the gospel. Three things that Timothy should do with the gospel or do on account of the gospel. Remembering the gospel, enduring for the gospel, and banking on the gospel. Let's take those one at a time. Number one, remembering the gospel. We see this in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Following that frequent, heavy theme, that important theme elsewhere in the Bible to remember, to remind, the Apostle Paul puts a heavy emphasis on remembrance as well. Not just here in this one verse, but, but four times before. You can see in chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, there's a string where he says, remember, and then remember, and then reminded, and remind you. 
And he'll bring it up again at the end of our passage. In verse 14, he tells Timothy, remind them as you teach them. And like elsewhere in the Bible where we find remembrance and reminding and remembering going on, so here Paul means so much more than simply do not forget. That's putting it negatively. Paul puts it positively. Remember. That means not just to bring it to mind, but but to keep it in mind, to ponder it, to chew on it, to bring to mind its fullest realities. To remember is almost to meditate. It is to taste and see that it is good. And you're to keep doing it. This is a certain tense in the Greek where it's, it's clear that it's not just a one and done kind of thing. You keep it there, keep it at the forefront and live in light of it. Remember Jesus Christ as preached in my gospel. The Apostle Paul says, the gospel, it is a a message, an announcement. It's something that's spoken in words. But it is about, fundamentally, a person, Jesus Christ. He's the content of the message. Our message isn't merely a way of life. It, It isn't merely a code of conduct. It isn't merely a system of beliefs. Most fundamentally, it is a person. And we need to know who he is and what he's like and what he did. So who is he? Well, he's Jesus Christ. That's not first name and last name. Jesus is his sort of earthly personal name. Remember, the angel told Mary, you will call his name Jesus The same as the Old Testament Hebrew, Joshua, which means God saves. You will call his name Yahshua, God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. That's his personal name. His office, though, or his title, is Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the the promised one. Promised from long ago and many times over. He's the fulfillment. He's the answer. Now it's interesting here, the word order, where Paul says Jesus Christ. That stands out in this context. Paul usually says Christ Jesus. In fact, he said Christ Jesus six times before our passage. And he'll use Christ Jesus another four times after our passage. But here, he uniquely refers to him as Jesus Christ. And I think that's intentional based on the the kind of ratio of emphasis that Paul has. I think he's here emphasizing Jesus' humanity, putting his earthly personal name first. Jesus is both God and man, and we need to keep both clearly in mind. He's human and divine. And that's reflected in what he did and who he is. So Paul says, remember Jesus Christ. And then two bullet points underneath that, really. Risen from the dead, the offspring of David. You see, if he's risen, that has enormous implications and significance. If he's risen from the dead, that means he was once dead. But he's not dead now, which means that he has conquered death. And if what he said is true, then then he was raised for us. He died for us and was raised for us. Mark 10 said he would be a ransom for sins. Or here's how Paul just put it earlier, a chapter before in 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 1, verse 9, where Paul says that God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been 
manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. The appearing is the whole package, his birth, his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection and ascension. In the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I know that's thick wording, but it is power-packed, and it is good, and it's worth our meditation. In fact, we could pause right here just to notice that different parts of the Bible feel differently, don't they? We've been in Psalm 119 in recent weeks, and this doesn't feel like Psalm 119, does it? No, this is a Pauline epistle, and they are power-packed, and Paul doesn't usually too often bother with poetry or, or words that are you know, ones you could skip over, not that you should. But here Paul is just twisting and twisting and modifying and modifying. He's arguing, I think, that Jesus died to conquer sin and death, and the resurrection proves that he did conquer sin and death. He proves to be the mediator between God and man, as he'll write elsewhere. His death and his resurrection prove then that he is, that other bullet point under verse 8, he's the offspring of David. What's that mean? Well, he's the offspring of King David. This means that Jesus is the one who fully and finally fulfilled those promises of old given to King David That he would have an eternal throne. And he would always have a son on the throne. And for hundreds of years before Christ came, it wasn't clear whether this would be some sort of unending succession of Davidic kings who die, but then are replaced by their progeny. Or what really happened, an eternal son of David came and ascended to his eternal throne And he will reign forever and ever. It's a really big deal. It might seem inconsequential. Like there were promises long ago and then fulfillment finally happened. Eh, You know, maybe that's something like, uh, you know, when someone foreshadows something and then it comes to to reality. or, Or when someone gives some sort of prediction and lo and behold, it happens. This is a big deal. It really God's testimony and the fulfillment of his plan were, it was hanging in the balance for for centuries, almost millennia. You go to a psalm like Psalm 89, which for 51 verses rehearses back to God his promises to David and his plans for King David, and then sort of wonders aloud to God, have you forgotten to finish this? Is it ever going to happen? Where's the Davidic king? And then we come to Matthew 1, 1 in the New Testament, and we find a genealogy of one who was born a son of David. So remember that. Remember God's fulfillment. Remember Jesus is the Christ, the answer. Remember he has come. Remember, he died and was risen and therefore is vindicated and is proven to be just whom he said he was, the offspring of David. This is what the Apostle Paul preached. This is what we've come to believe. This is the gospel. That's what Paul calls my gospel. And Why does he say my gospel here? Well, not because he made it up. Not because he was the architect behind it. He calls it my gospel, I think, because it was personal to him. He had possession of it, like any Christian can and does. And also because it was his message. It's what he said. It was his sermon. It's what he proclaimed. And so just like him, we can also proclaim a gospel which by faith now is our gospel, and we can encourage others to join us in embracing that gospel as their own. Remembering the gospel. Secondly, there is enduring for the gospel in verses 9 and 10. 
there, Paul, in a run-on sentence in verse 9 says, For which, meaning this gospel, talked about in verse 8, for, for this gospel I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Don't forget Paul's past. Paul, a.k.a. Saul, was at one time the chief persecutor and prosecutor of Christians. But in an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus one day on the road to Damascus, it changed everything. It's like the dominoes just fell one after another. If Jesus is risen, then Christianity is true, not something to be stomped out. If Jesus is risen, then Christians aren't heretics who must be stopped. They are followers of the true Messiah. They actually have the key then that unlocks the whole Old Testament scriptures. That means then that Jesus' death upon the cross wasn't an embarrassment, nor was it proof that he was cursed of God. No, it meant that he took on the shame of the cross and took on the payment of death for us. He bore our curse for us. The resurrection changes everything. It'll move a man like Saul or Paul from the comfy confines of, of being a Pharisee in Judaism and thrust him out into the world to represent that risen Christ wherever he says to go in order that others might believe, knowing full well that not all will believe, and some will hate you for what you say. The Apostle Paul knew that quite well, because he used to be on the other end. And that's what we find in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is this historical account of the spread of the gospel in the first few decades after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And from Acts chapter 9 on, the spotlight is largely on the Apostle Paul as he travels, proclaims Christ, sees some believe, and others vehemently resist it. The book of Acts ends with eight or nine chapters of Paul being arrested, imprisoned, on trial, and defending himself, and really defending the faith again and again and again. And so suffering is a big part of the book of Acts. It was certainly a big part of Paul's experience. But the book of Acts sort of ends with a non-ending, as you probably know. It ends with Paul in prison with a story unfinished. He's under house arrest in Rome, awaiting a hearing before Caesar, where no doubt he'll preach the gospel once again. And for some reason, that's where Luke, the author, put down his pen and stopped the book of Acts. But we know that there's more to the story based on the rest of Scripture. Apparently, after what happened in the book of Acts, Paul was released. He apparently traveled some more, spreading the gospel more and more. But apparently he was, some years later, arrested again. And at that point, the heat had been turned up on Christians and Christianity. By then, Nero had blamed the great fire of Rome on the Christians. And so, state-sponsored execution, really attempted extinction of Christians and Christianity was in full swing in Rome by the time that 2 Timothy was written, Paul's last letter, at least recorded in the Bible. As he says here in verse 9, he is bound with chains as a criminal. 
a severe criminal. The word means, you know, murderer, seditious kind of criminal, real, riotous, troublemaker. And that's not the only thing related to his suffering we find in this last letter. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. He tells Timothy there, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Or verse 15 of the same chapter, You are aware, Timothy, that all who are in Asia, all Christians, turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Or you can go to the end of the book where he picks up more of his suffering again. Chapter 4, verse 9, he says to Timothy, his beloved son in the faith, do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Others have gone on as well. Look at verse 14 of the last chapter. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. But beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. It's crazy to read of the great Apostle Paul suffering like this and being deserted by former friends as he was. But why does he need to tell Timothy this? I mean, is this just, uh, you know, Paul's last pity party? Is this just a bad day for the Apostle Paul where he didn't, like a good Englishman, you know, stiff upper lip, didn't do anything like that. He just let it all out because he couldn't keep it in anymore. Well, no, it wasn't that. Was it maybe to incite Timothy to get to Paul's side ASAP? Well, maybe it was that. But Paul reviews his own suffering to Timothy primarily to hearten Timothy, even to harden Timothy to the realities that opposition really should be the norm among Christians in this world. All who live godly in this life will suffer persecution. Opposition is what we can expect if we're faithful. But Paul reminds Timothy by way of example in the midst of his extreme suffering, we can endure, we can endure, we must endure. It's worth it. It's not senseless. It's not needless. He writes to Timothy about his own suffering to remind Timothy that even in all that suffering, the gospel is going out. It is spreading. That beautiful and masterful wordplay that Paul is chained up in prison, but the gospel is unchained in all of Rome. And apparently Timothy Timothy had been wobbling a bit in his faith and ministry in recent days. It seems like he'd been wobbling under the weight of opposition and difficulty and fear of man and and self-doubt and self-focus. When you read chapter 1 of this letter, you can somewhat read between the lines and perhaps anticipate why Paul would be saying this or that and that it might reflect something of a shortcoming in Timothy in those days. Perhaps Timothy was wimping out. Perhaps he was embarrassed by Paul's chains. Perhaps he was even doubting his salvation. Certainly doubting his calling as a preacher and pastor. And Paul writes to him to encourage him to be bold to suffer if necessary, to fan the flame of the gift that's within him that apparently had died down to a flicker. And so now if we can sort of just tiptoe back to our first point, Paul thinks that remembrance 
of Jesus Christ, the risen son of David, is something that will buoy Timothy up under this weight of oppression and opposition and fear of man. What does he need to do in suffering circumstances with self-doubt and timidity? He needs to remember Jesus Christ and remember him and remember him and remember him and meditate upon him. Paul's example will also be of help, as will an eye on the mission itself and what's at stake and the reminder that the suffering is not in vain. It sends a testimony. As Paul says in Philippians 1, it makes the brothers more bold and besides, it gives me opportunity with new people who watch over me as I'm in prison. I endure everything, Paul says, verse 10, for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation in Jesus. The elect. You see, God has a people for himself. It is a people who will believe because he will do heart surgery on them and open their hearts to, to, to receive his word. He'll give them new eyes to see, new ears to hear. He'll, he'll do that cardiac thing on a still heart and bring it to life and cause it to be. And so this reality of the elect or God's election, God's choosing here, it doesn't produce a kind of frozen fatalism for Paul, and it shouldn't for Timothy, but instead confidence and conviction. It produces assurance. God has people, and he will save them. They just need to hear it, and God will do the rest. It produces assurance and anticipation and even action. You see, in Acts 18, where Paul is told to go into a certain city, for there the Lord has many people. It doesn't mean they're already Christians. It means they will be Christians. Paul hasn't been there yet. He's told, go into that city. I have many people in that city, many people that I'll save through your spoken word. And Paul doesn't say, well, if you're just going to save them, then just save them. If you have many people in that city, well, what's my point in being there? Oh, no. Uh, you get the feeling that Paul got a little extra, you know, get up in his step and he cruised on to the next city, knowing God had many people in that city. And so this should be the case for every believer as well. We should have a confidence like Paul that we're willing to talk to anyone about the gospel even if they may, I mean, what are the options in our country? They may rudely put up their newspaper in the airplane seat next to us. And never talk for the rest of the flight. Ah, oh, such persecution. They may tell us, hey, you keep bringing this up, stop it, you. Ah, oh, such persecution. No, it, it could be that, you know, you, you lose a friendship. Mom and dad don't want you around. Or you lose a job. Hopefully not because you've been a jerk who doesn't work, but only tries to witness at work, but because you're just you're a Christian, you're acting like a Christian, and, and you're on the out, and eventually they'll throw you out. That can happen. Now you might ask, well, this whole thing of the elect here, I don't know if that's comforting at all to me. You might wonder, am I among the elect how do I know if I'm among the elect? Well, have you believed? That's what the elect do. If you've believed, then you're among the elect. If you believe today, guess what? If you truly believe, you're among the elect. That's what the elect do. Jesus died and was raised for people like you. And the, the message is, 
really being proclaimed to you today. That you, in Paul's words, that you also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Or as he said back in chapter 1, not by works. No, it's by his grace given to us in Christ Jesus. Specifically in his appearing and all that entailed. His perfect life, his sacrificial death, his victorious resurrection. You put your eggs in all that, in that one basket and you'll be saved. And you'll be among those in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. But if you don't believe, if you continue to refuse to believe, if you continue to reject Christ, then you have no ground for believing that you're at peace with God and that things will go well for you on the other side. And that's why the last few verses of our passage are both promise and warning. They have to do with, number three, banking on the gospel. Banking on the gospel. Verse 11 begins with a trustworthy saying. That is um, an easily memorizable go-to thesis for the early church, apparently. Paul has mentioned other trustworthy sayings. Uh, In 1 Timothy, there are three or four of them. There's also one in Titus, if you want to go hunting for them, the trustworthy sayings. It's not that they were more trustworthy than other things in the Bible, like, man, you better double underline this. No, no, it's, it's that this had become a trustworthy saying among the church, and now Paul throws it in the Bible, and so like the rest of the Bible, it has God's inherent weight. It is inspired. But it's a saying. That's a good thing. It's a saying worth memorizing, and it gives encouragement and or warning. Let's read those verses again, verses 11 to 13. The saying is trustworthy. What is it? Well, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You hear there's a staccato to it. There's there's a rhythm to it. There are actually two sets of parallel lines. Here's a great case where the verse numbers that were inserted later on, the Apostle Paul didn't write with verse numbers. You probably know. Here's where they're just put in bad places, right? Because you've got the first two of these sayings in 11b, and then 12a, and then the next pair is 12b and 13a. But the first set is surely positive. It's an encouragement. The second set seems to be negative, a warning. The first is an encouragement. If you've died with him, that means If you have, as it is pictured in the waters of baptism, identified with his death and resurrection, now risen to walk in newness of life, and if you ongoingly die to self, as Paul says, die to sin, die to temptation, not perfectly so, but genuinely so, if we've died with him, then we will live with him the one who has been resurrected. If we endure, like he endured, not to the extent he endured, but but we follow a crucified Savior, no surprise that we suffer persecution or even just suffer. If we endure, we will also reign with him. What great encouragement. But then we got a pair of warnings, I think. At the end of verse 12, if we deny him, he will also deny us. That's pretty straightforward. It's really close to what Jesus said in Matthew 10. Whoever denies me in front of men, I will deny them in front of my father. 
And the second line there in verse 13 is a little tougher. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That's a little tougher because not everyone agrees that it's a warning. Some people think that this is a very great comfort sort of thrown at the end in an unexpected way to give a twist to remind people of this truth, which we all would agree with, that ultimately salvation doesn't depend on us, that ultimately we're not saved by our faith, we're saved through faith. Faith is the instrument through which grace comes. And so even when we have times of faithlessness, he remains faithful. And we could put it this way, the covenant of grace does not depend upon us but upon him, God himself. Well, that's all true, but it's probably not true in this passage. I, th- I think that there probably are two positive, encouraging statements and then two negative or warning kind of statements. So the last one then would mean, if there's no faith, God will still be faithful to himself. He can't deny himself. He isn't just love. He is also just. He will not be mocked. If you deny him, he'll deny you. If you are faithless, not a little less faith than his ideal, Not, I believe, help my unbelief, like one man prayed, and Jesus said he had never seen such great faith when that man prayed like that. No, that's not what this means. Faithless here is without faith, and without faith, God will be faithful to himself, and faithful to his warning, and faithful to his word of judgment, and he will not deny himself. So heed that warning today. If you're not a Christian, if you've been denying Jesus, Jesus himself said, whoever denies me, I will deny before the Father. Heed the warning. If you're a professed Christian who's, I don't know, contemplating throwing in the towel of Christianity. Maybe it hasn't worked well enough. It hasn't lived up to your expectations. Maybe it's harder now than it used to be. Maybe you're sick of trying and trying and trying and you just want to be free. Well, you may be proving that it hasn't been real even from the beginning. So heed this warning if you're a professed Christian right now and you are contemplating cashing in on Jesus. He remains faithful. He does not deny himself. If you want to go the no faith route, he'll be faithful in judgment. It's a terrifying thing. If you're a Christian and you're even a little bit wobbly right now, like one young pastor named Timothy was many years ago, well, receive the correction and the encouragement, right? Receive the correction to endure, to press on, to keep at it. And hear the encouragement, the promise. If you endure, you will reign with him. Not just not go to hell, you will reign with him. And if you die to yourself, you will live with him forever and ever. If we are banking on the gospel, then we will be willing to endure anything for him. Are you banking on the gospel? Well, let's remember to bank on the gospel. Let's keep remembering the one we're banking on. 
not ourselves, not even our faith. That is true. Let us remember him. Not just not forget him. Let's remember him, ponder him, bring him to the forefront of our minds and walk in that reality and seek to live it out more and more. Why? Well, because he's Jesus Christ. He's risen from the dead. He's the promised one, the offspring of David, the anointed, the answer. He's come. We know him. This is what you've come to believe. This is what you are to proclaim. This is the gospel, the good news, the truth. It's what every one of us needs. Remember it and comfort yourself in it and give thanks to God for it. And have a renewed boldness about it. And if you need help then beyond this spoken word, then remember that he also gives us symbols. They go together, the spoken word and the symbols of bread and wine. The, broken, the spoken word tells us what the broken bread means. It represents his broken body upon the cross for our sins. We wouldn't know what a red cup would mean apart from Jesus telling telling us, this is my blood. Not literally, no. We're not drinking his blood. He's in heaven with a glorified body. The sacrifice has already been made, but this is an emblem of it. It's a memorial of it. We are to remember him, his death and his resurrection, his body and his blood, his life and his death. And we do it through the word and we do it through the symbols he's given us. Here's how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 11. When Jesus, the night before he was betrayed, had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so this morning we remember him. We remember him in word. And we remember him in bread and cup. We need to remember our need. We need to remember who he is. We need to remember where we've placed our hope. We need to remember that all of his promises are yes and amen in Jesus. We need to remember the cost at which Our Savior paid for our sins. 